Okay, it's 7.30 and we're going to get started. Welcome to the March meeting of the Johnson Space Center Astronomical Society. I'm Doug Holland, the president of the JSCAS, and this is our agenda for this evening. Tonight for our main speaker, we have Larry McHenry, who's actually from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and he's going to be bringing us E.E. E. Barnard and his Dark Nebula. Then I'll have a member's minute about our JSCAS star party at the X-Bar Ranch in Fort McCavitt. And then I'll have a DIY astronomy on homemade eyepieces. And we'll wrap it up with David Havlin, who will bring us star party news. If you have questions or comments for our presenters this evening, you can submit those to the email on this slide, jscaslive at gmail.com. Or you can submit them as a YouTube comment if you have an account that will allow you to do that. For our main speaker this evening, uh, Larry will be taking all the questions at the end of his talk, so you can go ahead and submit your questions or comments, and then he'll address all those at the end when he gets to the end. All right, so first up, we got Larry McKinney with E.E. E. Barnard and his Dark Nebula, but I would first like to tell you a little bit about Larry. Larry McHenry is a member of the Oil Region Astronomical Society, O-R-A-S, and the Kiski Astronomers of Western Pennsylvania. Larry has sketched an EAA, Electronic Assisted Astronomy, video, observed his way several times through the Messier catalog and recently completed observing all 2,482 of the Herschel objects. Currently, Larry is working on EAA observing projects involving ARP Peculiar Galaxies, Able Planetary Nebula, Sharpless H2 Nebula, and Barnard Dark Nebula. You can learn more about Larry's astronomical interests online at his web portal, www.stellar-journeys.org. And with that, I would like to turn it over to Larry McHenry. Okay, thank you very much, Doug. Uh, you gotta and, go. Um, okay, thank you, Doug, um, Trevor, and... Um, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Larry McHenry. I'm from uh, Western Pennsylvania, the Pittsburgh area. Um, tonight, we're going to talk about Edward Emerson Bernard and his dark nebula. So, what are dark nebula? Well, visible throughout our galaxy are clouds of interstellar matter, thin but widespread wisps of gas and dust. Some of the stars near nebula are often very massive and their high energy radiation can excite the gas of the nebula to shine. Such nebula we call emission nebula. Now, if the stars are dimmer or further away, they're um, in the, the nebula is more dusty, their light is reflected by that dust in the nebula and can be seen as what we call a reflection nebula. And finally, some nebula are visible only by the light from the objects behind them. Uh, the dark nebula is blocking that light. These we call dark nebula. So, Edward Emerson Bernard was a professor of astronomy at the University of Chicago Yerkes Observatory. As a pioneer in astrophotography, he cataloged a series of dark nebula of the Milky Way. Through this work of studying the structure of the Milky Way, Bernard discovered that certain dark regions of our galaxy are actually clouds of gas and dust that obscure the more distant stars in the background. Today, we're going to look back on uh, Bernard's life and his accomplishments. And along the way, we'll review a few of my observations of his dark nebula. So outline what we're gonna talk about tonight, Bernard's early years, his childhood, how he became an astronomer, his life as a professional astronomer at uh, both Lick Observatory and Yerkes Observatory and my observations, some of his more popular dark nebula. And then we're gonna wrap up, talk a little bit about Bernard's legacy. So, Edward Emerson Bernard was born on December 16th, 1857 in Nashville, Tennessee at the cusp of the Civil War. His mother, Elizabeth, at the age of 42, had moved the family from Cincinnati to Nashville a few months prior to Edward's birth when his father, Reuben Bernard, had passed away. The family lived in near poverty with Elizabeth as the sole provider, working several small jobs, the most profitable being that of her making wax flowers, which she had kind of a skill at creating. 
While the family moved multiple times about the city during Edward's early years, with several locations being near the Cumberland River, where um, once Edward was old enough, he could swim out and recover supplies lost down lost in the river by battling upstream armies. Well, due to the turbulence from the war, Edward was not able to really attend a formal school setting, only getting in about two months of actual classroom time. But he was homeschooled by his mother at an early age to both read and write. Once the war had ended, Nashville began to rebound. To help support the family, Edward, at the age of nine, was able to find a job at a local photography studio. The shop owner was in need of a young assistant whose primary job would be to keep a giant portrait and larger camera located on the shop's roof, pointed at the sun in order to provide enough natural light for the photo enlargements that uh, the shop did. Uh, well, having gone through several other boys who couldn't keep the camera from drifting off track of the sun when they would fall asleep, Edward was given a chance at the job. Not only was Edward able to keep the camera on track throughout the day, but he was actually curious in learning how it worked, and he developed an interest in camera lenses and learning photographic techniques from the shop owner. Well, during his tracking duties, Edward soon noticed that the sun didn't follow the same path at the same rate every day, and he discovered that it varied based on the season. This was Edward's first exposure to astronomy. Walking home after dark, his interest in following the sun's path soon led him to begin watching the stars. During the summer, once home, he would spend his free time lying in the back of an old wagon, gazing at the stars overhead. And from that, he became interested in the night sky. Well, as he would lay there in a wagon, there was one particular bright white star that shone overhead that always held his attention. And he came to think of it as his special star to watch. Well, due to a sketchy formal education, Edward went for years not knowing that star's name, Vega. Then, oh, in 1870, when he was 13, Edward, through the help of one of his co-workers, acquired parts from an old ship's spyglass, and he built a small um, refractor with a two-inch lens, which Edward then used to study the moon and the planets Venus and Jupiter. Then, at the age of 17, Edward got the chance to teach himself astronomy when a friend of his borrowed money from Edward and left as collateral a stack of books. One of those books was a text on astronomy. And Edward was finally able to learn the names of the stars and constellations that he had been watching since he was a young boy. Within two years, in 1876, at the age of 19, Edward had saved over half a year's worth of salary, and he used that to buy an equatorially mounted five-inch refractor made in New York for a whopping $380. He used his telescope to continue observing the moon, planets, and double stars and clusters, but he most enjoyed sweeping along the Milky Way with it. Now, the following year, in 1877, the American Association for the Advancement of Science held its annual convention in Nashville at the new Vanderbilt University. Through his local connections with the photography studio, Bernard was able to meet with the association's president, prominent professional astronomer Simon Newcomb. There, Edward asked Newcomb how to go about becoming a professional astronomer, hoping that he was already on the right track. Um, well, Newcomb, after learning about Bernard's background and his lack of education, didn't really hold out much hope for Edward becoming an astronomer, as he didn't have the required mathematical knowledge. Uh, but Newcomb did suggest to Edward that he should take up comet searching as a way to perhaps become a professional observer and spent a few minutes explaining the, the methods and details of how about of how to go about doing comet sweeping. Well, Edward kind of came away from that meeting feeling a little bit crushed, uh, but he resolved that he was going to take Newcomb's advice and begin searching for comets. Well, after the uh, depressing meeting with Simon Newcomb, uh, Bernard hired a math tutor. Edward would spend nights that were cloudy or moonlit studying with the tutor and then clear nights out observing. He also began to make more practical, detailed observations, sketching Jupiter's bands, the great red spot, the Galilean moon's shadow transits, whatever he could, and even participated in recording observations of the 1878 Mercury transit. 
Through these efforts, Bernard became a skilled record keeper and a planetary sketcher. <clears throat> Three years later, on May 21st of 1881, Bernard's sweeping paid off and he discovered his first comet. Unfortunately, though, he didn't know the proper technique to measure its position or even how to report it correctly to the professionals, so he didn't get credit for it. Bernard realized he needed help in learning how to make the mathematical calculations and reporting techniques, so he reached out to contacts that he had made at Vanderbilt University. Well, the university had recently completed building a new observatory with a six-inch Cook refractor, but they had no astronomer on staff to run it. So the university's head of the School of Engineering offered Edward a job as the Vanderbilt Observatory assistant astronomer, and he enrolled Bernard as a student to acquire the necessary education in math and physics. Bernard was put in charge of the observatory, which, besides the six-inch refractor, included a meridian circle and clocks and several spectroscopes. Well, this was Bernard's big break that he was hoping for. He would spend the day studying mathematics and then spend the night observing the sky. Edward considered sleep a waste of time, and he soon became known around campus as the man who never slept. Before long, Edward's diligence paid off again as he discovered another comet that fall on September 17, 1881, which became his first official find. And then a year later, another new comet discovery on September 14, 1882. Edward even found time to court and marry Rhoda Calvert, the English sister of one of his photography studio co-workers. From his discoveries, comet discoveries, Bernard became a sort of local Nashville celebrity. His discoveries also proved to be financially rewarding because at the time, this wealthy American manufacturer of medicinal products named Hubert Warner was offering a $200 reward to any American who would discover a comet. Bernard used his first findings to buy land and build a house for him and his new wife. And it seemed that every time a mortgage payment was due, Bernard would discover a new comet and once again collect the reward in time to pay it off. His house was known locally as the Comet House because it was paid for by comets. Um, by 1887, Edward had gone on to discover a total of nine new comets. Well, in addition to comet sweeping, Bernard also spent time using the observatory's six-inch refractor observing the planets and other deep sky objects such as star clusters and the various nebula scattered around the night sky. One night, July 17, 1883, while observing near M20 in Sagittarius, Bernard discovered a small triangular shaped dark hole near a small star cluster uh, that we know today is NGC 6520. This was Edward's first telescopic discovery of what would become known decades later as Dark Nebula. It was also Edward's favorite example throughout his life of a Dark Nebula. Well, Bernard never did officially graduate from Vanderbilt University, as in 1887, Edward was offered a job as one of the initial staff astronomers at the new Lick Observatory on Mount Hamilton. Bernard jumped at the chance to use the new soon-to-be-commissioned 36-inch refractor at the Lick, which would become the world's largest telescope. And he promptly quit his job at Vanderbilt. He sold his house to his brother-in-law, and he moved Rhoda and himself to Northern California. So, Bernard now has gone from an amateur stargazer to a, an observatory. Now he's a professional astronomer. So, his life as a professional astronomer. Lick Observatory. Well, during the mid-1880s, work on the new Lick Observatory and its 36-inch refractor was a hot topic among of the day among the astronomical world. Edward had been following it in the news, and once it was announced that Edwin S. Holden was named as the director of the observatory, Bernard began a letter-writing campaign to him in hopes of getting a job at the new observatory. The first ever to be built on top of a mountain. Through Bernard's comet discoveries and good reviews from other astronomers that knew of Bernard's work, 
Holden decided that, well, even though Bernard didn't have a top educational background that Holden would have preferred for his staff, that Bernard's keen observing abilities was what he needed for the new observatory. So the director offered Edward a job as a junior member of the astronomy staff and was assigned time on the lesser telescopes of the observatory, such as a 12-inch Clark refractor with Edward pictured sitting underneath here, and also a small six and a half inch equatorial refractor. <clears throat> Bernard was shut out of any observing time on the big 36 inch refractor, which eventually led to a run long running feud between Bernard and Holden. Well, unfortunately for Bernardo, he moved a little bit too soon from Tennessee. As unknown to him, there had been delays in building both the observatory dome and the supporting building for the 36-inch telescope. So when Bernard's, when the Bernard's arrived in San Francisco, the observatory hadn't yet been turned over to use. So there was no job for Edward. Um, Edward had to take a job at a local law office as a document copper, copier. And he had to sell his beloved five-inch refractor for enough money for him and Rhoda to live off of until the new observatory officially opened. But finally, in May of 1888, the observatory was fully completed and Edward was able to start work as a paid Lick Observatory astronomer. Bernard wasted no time in sweeping up a new comet that September and then another one a month later in October. <clears throat> now, one of Bernard's early assignments was to utilize his studio photography expertise and begin to systematically photograph the Milky Way. So Bernard took a used six-inch studio portrait lens, a Petzval doublet named the Willard lens that the observatory had acquired, and he mounted it in a wooden box camera back that he had built by hand. Edward then piggybacked this homemade box photographic camera on the small six-and-a-half-inch observatory refractor, and he began experimenting with guided exposures. And here's a picture of uh, um, Edward actually uh, guiding the scope and he's wearing his state-of-the-art beaver fur coat to keep himself warm at night. <clears throat> so Edward's wide field time exposures revealed details in the large-scale structures of bright star clouds obscured by what looked to be dark holes or voids. His photographs soon became a popular item to pass around the observatory staff as they showed the richness of the Milky Way star clouds as they had never been seen before. This was the start of what would become Bernard's life work, gathering evidence as to the nature of these dark features. Were they really actual voids in the matter of space, or were they something else? Well, during this period, Bernard also made some other interesting observations using the 12-inch, uh, such as an occultation of Saturn's moons Iapetus by Saturn's rings on November 1st, 1889, in which he observed shadow bands passing over the moon caused by the rings. Bernard also successfully photographed the total solar eclipse of January 1st, 1889, producing at that time the best images ever made of the solar corona. Bernard also accelerated his comet discoveries while at Lick, finding another eight comets over the next six years, one of which uh, eventually was called 1892 T1, was the first comet to be discovered photographically. But finally, in July 1892, after taking his case directly to the Caltech Lick Observatory Board of Directors, Bernard was awarded observing time on the 36-inch refractor. Well, shortly thereafter, in August of 1892, using his newly won time on the 36-inch refractor, Bernard was the first to visually observe gaseous emissions coming from a recent nova in Auriga, and he correctly deduced that the outflow was the result of a stellar explosion. It was the birth of a planetary nebula. One month later, though, Bernard was to use the 36-inch telescope to make a discovery that rocked the world and brought international fame to both Lick Observatory and Edward Emerson Bernard. It was the night of Friday, September 9th, 1892. During Bernard's observing session with the 36-inch refractor, he pointed the great telescope to Jupiter. While observing Ganymede approaching the, disc, the planet's disk for a transit, 
he spied a faint, a faint spark of light between the two. And then as he watched it, he noticed that the spark was also moving. It was a new fifth moon, the first new satellite of Jupiter to be discovered since Galileo in 1610. After a couple more nights of confirmation observations and orbital calculations, the observatory broke the news to the world. Well, and as expected, the observatory was swamped by all the local people coming up you know, during the daytime, you know, hanging out, you know, getting up on the roof of the observatory, staying there over at night, wanting to get a view of the this new moon. Um, now, while it was Bernard's right to name the new moon, he could never really settle on what to call it. Um, he just kept referring, referring it as the fifth moon of Jupiter. But eventually, upon the suggestion of French astronomer Camille Flammarion, the new fifth moon of Jupiter was named Amalthea. Jupiter's new fifth moon also became the last solar system satellite to be discovered visually, as all future discoveries have since been made by photography. Well, now with even more time allotted on the 36-inch refractor because of his discoveries, Bernard tried using the old 6-inch Willard lens camera on the Great Telescope, but the lens had deteriorated from the night air and it needed to be repolished. So it was sent off to John Brashear's optical workshop here in Pittsburgh uh, to be refigured. A local benefactor of the observatory named Colonel C.F. Crocker donated funds to build a dedicated small dome with an attached darkroom and an equatorial mount for the new Willard lens, which was now renamed the Crocker Telescope. Well, using this, Bernard went back to spending his non-36 evening, 36 inch evenings to photograph dramatic wide-filled pictures of the Milky Way, particularly the striking dark holes in the Sagittarius region and around Rho Ophiuchi. Bernard gave fanciful names to some of these objects, such as uh, the snake, the pipe, and the parrot's head. Bernard still considered to view these objects as actual voids in space, but the data was beginning to point him in another direction. Bernard also took time out to use the Crocker telescope to photograph comets. In 1893, he was the first to photographically record a tail disconnection event that occurred with Comet Brooks of that year. And also during this period, Edward on his own purchased a small cheap projecting lens uh, with about one half inch in diameter. Uh, he made an even wider field lantern camera with it, and he piggybacked it on the Crocker telescope. With this new camera, he was able to photograph entire constellations and was the first to image an enormous nebula in Orion in its entirety, which we now today call Bernard's Loop. Finally, though, by 1895, the feud between Bernard and Lick Observatory director Edward Holden peaked with Holden refusing to publish Bernard's wide field and comet images. In an opportune moment, George Hale made an offer to Edward Bernard to come work at the new Yerkes Observatory with the title of Professor of Practical Astronomy, where he would have full access as a staff astronomer to the new 40-inch refractor being built. Bernard immediately accepted, and he was soon on his way to Williams Bay, Wisconsin, with his lantern camera and unpublished wide field Milky Way photographs. Yerkes Observatory. Well, with the October 1895 offer from Hell, Bernard and Rhoda once again sold off most of their belongings and moved to the small town of Williams Bay along the shore of Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. There they purchased land next to the new observatory and had a two-story wooden frame house built. Well, while waiting for the 40-inch refractor to be completed, Edward put to use George Hale's personal 12-inch refractor that Hale had installed in a smaller dome at Yerkes and was able to continue his visual observations. Also during this time, in 1896, the prestigious English Royal Astronomical Society awarded its gold medal to Bernard for his work, and Edward spent a month over in England lecturing at Oxford and Cambridge universities. But finally, in May of 1897, the 40-inch lens by Alvin Clark was finished. It was taken to Yerkes and installed in the Great Telescope Tube. The telescope performed flawlessly. 
But unfortunately, less than a week later, the support system on one side of the movable observatory floor failed, causing that side to crash down 45 feet, wrecking it. The 40-inch telescope was out of commission now until the middle of August. But finally, the floor was fixed. The observatory officially opened. Uh, Bernard was one of the principal observers on the 40-inch refractor, and he would never miss a clear night at the observatory. Edward used the telescope visually by taking micrometer measurements of the planets, moons, and globular clusters, and planetary nebula. In particular, Bernard tracked the globulars M3, M5, and M13 in hopes of determining their distances by parallax, and he tracked planetary nebulas M27, M57, and M97 in hope of determining whether they were physically changing, whether he could detect movement within the nebula. In 1897, Bernard made a successful sales pitch to the wealthy Yerkes Observatory benefactor, Catherine Bruce, to fund a new wide-field 10-inch photographic refractor telescope for Bernard's exclusive use. This instrument became known as the Bruce Telescope, and its 10-inch doublet lens was made by John Brashear of Pittsburgh. It was also paired with a six and a quarter inch German Voltlanger portrait lens. With it, once completed in September of 1900, Bernard took over 4,000 images and made a number of photographic nebula discoveries and re-imaged the large-scale Milky Way structures that he had earlier photographed using the small lantern camera while he was at Lick. It was the richness of the star clouds and outstanding Milky Way features showing much more finer detail in these dark regions than ever before, which became the center of Bernard's work. This was the evidence from his own photographs and his visual observations that eventually convinced Bernard, beginning in 1913, and it finally came around to the thought that these dark voids were actually obscuring dark matter in front of and blocking the view of the more distant Milky Way behind them. This was considered a huge discovery among the astronomical world, as now all the various galaxy formation models would have to take into account these dark clouds of gas and dust. Well, from the start of his time at Yerkes, using his little one and a half inch lantern camera, and then once completed the Bruce 10 inch photographic telescope, Bernard photographed nearly every new comet that came around, once again capturing a number of images showing comet tail structures, disconnects, and disturbances that were important, and analyzing the physics of comet behavior. Using this data in 1909, Bernard came up with the theory that these comet tail changes were caused by the effects of solar disturbances, the same that would cause geomag geomagnetic storms and aurora on the Earth. Bernard also went on in May of 1916 to discover the star with the fastest proper motion of 10 arc seconds per year, since named Bernard's star, which is a ninth magnitude star located in the constellation of Ephucus. Uh, this is also one of the closest nearby stars to our solar system at about six light years. And then even in 1918, Bernard, at the age of 60, once again went on a total solar eclipse expedition, this time to Green River, Wyoming, for a 98-second eclipse on June 8th of that year. Bernard was successful in recording both the inner corona and limb prominences. So, observations of Bernard's dark nebula. Where, so where can you find E.E. E. Bernard's dark nebula? Well, dark nebula can be found all along the glowing band of the Milky Way. Um, it's the uh, glowing band of light that we know is our, our home galaxy. Now, some large nebula are best suited for the naked eye, while others are telescopic and require larger apertures to visually see. Fortunately, though, there are many objects that display nicely using binoculars or small, rich-filled telescopes. Um, while a number of dark nebulas are fairly easy to find, though, most do require observing from a dark country sky location, um, you know, such as Cherry Springs here in Pennsylvania that I like to go to. Now, when you do go to that dark location to observe Bernard Dark Nebula, it helps to have a list of his catalog. 
One of my favorite book resources for Bernard's catalog is his actual atlas, a photographic atlas of selected regions of the Milky Way. Um, back in 2011, this atlas was revised by Gerald Dobick and published by Cambridge uh, Publishing. And uh, it contains charts, descriptions, and Bernard's photographs. It's a highly useful tool. I highly recommend if you think you're going to really get into observing dark nebula that you you pick up this book. Um, but there's also, if you don't want to get a book, there's also computer software programs that you can get to help. Uh, for example, there's Deep Sky Planner by Steve Tuma. Uh, you can do a search on your favorite catalog. You can generate a list uh, to help you uh, keep track of the ones you've observed. You can even generate star charts from the, the list. This particular example here is actually of the colander star clusters, but you can create also a list just like it for all the Bernard Dark Nebula. And of course, if you're using a planetarium program on your favorite device, laptop, phone, whatever, <clears throat> you can utilize it to show the Dark Nebula that you're interested in finding. Uh, this is an example from my favorite program I like to use called Earth-Centered Universe, where I can show Dark Nebula, for example, BA6 in Sagittarius. So what are the ingredients to successfully observe dark nebula? Well, observing them visually requires maintaining dark adaptation, having good star charts, and slow sweeping with a wide field, low power telescope. For example, uh, having a nice 80 millimeter um, F5 or shorter refractor P back on a, a larger telescope would work very well. The 80 millimeter would act as a low power RFT, giving you a wide field in which to find the dark nebula. And then the larger telescope it's attached to allows you to use higher magnifications on some of the uh, details that, uh, depending on the object of the, that you're looking at. Of course, you're gonna need all your averted vision observing skills to find and bring out the subtle differences in these objects. Um, <clears throat> So again, visually, wide field, low power telescopes, um, dark sky location, dark adaption, very critical, um, electronically aided. Um, if you, you can use deep sky video cameras, regular CCD cameras, DSLRs. You can mount these on really any kind of telescope from a 50 millimeter scope all the way up uh, to as big as you got. And of course, both regardless of what technique you use, you're gonna need star charts, planetarium program, an observing plan, of course, uh, Bernard's list of dark nebula. And of course, again, for visual observers and also for imagers, dark nebula can be challenging in that even with an accurate go-to mount, you may not, it may not position the telescope squarely on the object to frame it the way you want or show the, the best feature of it. So again, having some type of uh, atlas or uh, a guidebook, uh, have pictures or sketches of the dark nebula will help you in locating and identifying the most interesting sections of these dark nebula and framing your images. And of course, another example here of a, a great guidebook to have in observing dark nebula is the Night Sky Observer's Guide, Volume 4, about the Milky Way by George Keppel. Um, and as you can see here, I circled it includes all of E.E. E. Bernard's dark nebula. Highly recommend this book to use for dark nebula and really anything along the Milky Way. So let's run through a few of my observations of Bernard's dark nebula to give you some examples of what you might see the next time you're out visually observing or maybe imaging dark nebula. First up, everyone's favorite, everybody's heard of this one, B33, uh, otherwise known as the Horsehead Nebula in Orion. Um, currently visible this time of year. It's uh, located off of Orion's belt uh, by the bright star Almatek. And it's also backlit by a, uh, uh, a bright emission nebula uh, called IC434. Uh, here's a couple of uh, images from a uh, analog um, video capture camera, black and white camera. Uh, this gives you a good approximation of how it might look visually through a uh, medium to a large telescope. Uh, most telescopes here, uh, uh, medium size or smaller, you might see just a little tiny little dark nub there backlit by the nebula. The larger the scope you have, the more detail you can see, you start bringing out the shape of the horse head itself. And of course, 
almost any kind of imaging setup will actually show the horse head nebula in its full glory. Um, here's a couple examples using a 60 millimeter refractor. This was actually my guide scope that I stuck my main imaging camera on for a lark. And as you can see, it, it brought out the horse head quite nicely. And of course, through the main scope itself, uh, using, a, again, a, a, a narrow band uh, filter. Um, again, these are somewhat longer exposures than what you would do with video astronomy. 30 seconds, 180 seconds, using software to stack these on the fly for, you know, 30, 40 minutes. But again, you can see where imaging really brings out the detail in dark nebula. Then there's uh, the Snake Nebula, B72, another popular nebula among uh, amateur astronomers, located in Ophiuchus. Um, again, it, it does, uh, you know, visually using, you know, medium-sized small telescopes, um, uh, it does kind of have a little slithering appearance to it like a snake. Uh, there's several other Bernard Nebula nearby that sometimes it's referred to as the snake and her eggs. And as you see here, using larger scopes, you can't really fit this object all in one image. Um, so, yes, this object does do better with wide field, rich, rich field type telescopes, wide field eyepieces. Here's an image uh, made with a, um, um, a, a CMOS camera. Uh, again, this one had a wider field format. I was able to fit the entire snake into the field of view. Another favorite is the ink spot, again, uh, known as B B86. This is located near M20 off the teapot uh, spout. Uh, again, this is Bernard's favorite dark nebula. Um, <clears throat> and through small telescopes, Richfield telescopes, it, you can actually tell it does stand out nicely from the bright background of the Milky Way. And of course, the star cluster in GC 6520 makes it easy to find and of course, using larger um, telescopes of um, um, more uh, you know, CMOS type cameras, you can bring out much more uh, better detail with it. The Parrot Head Nebula, B87. This is located just below the spout of the teapot, Sagittarius. Um, if you use your imagination a little bit, you can actually get a parrot head out of this. If you uh, see, here's the, the the head of the bird, here's his beak. And if you recall, parrots have kind of this little area around their eye. And of course, the, this bright pairing of stars makes up the, the parrot's eye. So uh, apparently Bernard did have quite an imagination. Again, this is what it would sort of look like visually through a telescope uh, and also through an imaging camera. Another popular um, dark nebula is called the Pipe Nebula, B78, located also in the Fucus. Uh, this is actually quite a large object. It's uh, visible by your naked eye or maybe even binoculars, but again, you need to be at a dark country site to be able to see this. And uh, it does look like a pipe. You have the bowl of the pipe where you put your tobacco and, of course, the stem of the pipe that you would smoke it. <clears throat> and then finally, um, there's one, it's known, um, it's not really uh, an official Bernard Dark Nebula, uh, but it's made up of multiple pieces of other Bernard Dark Nebula. This is called the Galactic Dark Horse. And it's located again in a fucus here, very close to the Snake Nebula, actually the Pipe Nebula. And this is sort of what it looks like. The Pipe Nebula, BA6, actually makes up the back portion of the horse. So if you think of a horse, you know, you got the body of the horse, here's his back legs, again, the Pipe Nebula. And these several other Bernard's Nebula make up the, the front legs of the horse. And here's his head here. And um, it must be a show horse. You see he's got his leg bent there. He's kind of prancing. And it looks like here's a little tuft of feathers coming off the top of his head. So he's probably some type of a, a circus horse. But again, uh, uh, using your imagination, you can have a little bit of fun with this dark nebula. And this is such a large structure. It's visible to the naked eye and uh, binoculars also helps. Again, also a dark sky location. And finally, um, you can look for Bernard Dark Nebula embedded within other deep sky objects, such as M20, uh, the Triffid Nebula, and M8, the Lagoon Nebula. Um, again, here they, here's what you would see probably uh, resembling a telescopic view of both the Lagoon and the Triffid. Uh, you know, the areas that divide up the Triffid, the, the Lagoon portion, 
These are actually Bernard Dark Nebula. Of course, you know, again, using uh, various types of narrow band broadband filters and, you know, CMOS CCD cameras, you can bring out lots of great detail in these dark nebula uh, within these, these objects. But these objects make it really easy to find these dark nebula. <clears throat> so, Bernard's legacy. In 1902, after much prompting from colleagues, both at Yerkes and Lick, Bernard took up the task of publishing his earlier Lick Observatory Comet and Milky Way photographs made with the six inch Willard Lens Crocker telescope. While well, being the perfectionist that he was, Edwards spent years experimenting with various Chicago printers using halftone processes, colotype printing, etc. But he was never happy with the quality of the what his printed pictures looked like. Well, finally, Edward found a printer that he was satisfied with, and his images, along with a write-up, were published as Volume 11 of the publications of the Lick Observatory in September of 1914. <clears throat> Even though the images were now over 20 years old, the Lick photographs were declared groundbreaking, and the publication became a valuable addition to every professional observatory and astronomical institution. In 1907, during this process, Bernard attained additional funding from the Carnegie Institution for a publication of his wide-field Milky Way photographs made with the 10-inch Bruce telescope. Using what he had learned during the uh, process trying to find printers for his earlier work, um, he spent almost the next decade continuing working with various print studios to find one that could reliably replicate his images in the best format. Well, after a number of false starts, Bernard finally came to the realization that none of these printers would ever be able to meet his high quality standard in the form of paper printed images. So he decided that it would be worth the extra cost to have actual photographic prints made of each negative as a separate photograph that would be pasted into the pages of each individual copy of the atlas. The printer would then create photographic print batches of each individual image. Bernard would go through each one separately, keeping only the best quality prints and rejecting any lesser qualities copies. He would then send the rejects back to be reprinted, and then he would get them back and once again go through again and select the best ones. During this process, Edward ended up sorting through nearly 35,000 prints by hand to hand select only the finest ones of consistent uniform quality that he considered worth including in his book. But before he could realize and finalize his Atlas of Dark Nebula, long-standing health issues that Edward had neglected finally caught up to him. Declining in health brought on from untreated diabetes and heart issues, Edward Emerson Bernard, at the age of 65, passed away on February 6, 1923, at Yerkes Observatory in Williams Bay, Wisconsin. As requested, Bernard was buried in his hometown of Nashville, where he was giving a hero's funeral procession fitting to a state official and actually laid uh, in state at the, in the rotunda at the state capitol there in uh, Nashville. But fortunately, though, his assistant and niece, Mary Calvert, who started working for Edward in 1905, along with the current director of Yerkes Observatory at the time, Edwin Frost, dedicated themselves to finishing Bernard's work. So in 1927, Edward Emerson Bernard's greatest accomplishment, his photographs of the Milky Way listing 370 of his Bernard objects, was published as a two-volume photographic atlas called a photographic atlas of selected regions of the Milky Way. Only about a thousand copies of these were printed, and they soon were taken up by all the various professional observatories and universities around the world. But to even today, though, the occasional first edition copy becomes available, and these are highly sought after items, and these books will go for quite a large sum when one of them does come available. So, in conclusion, E. E. Bernard is considered by some to be the last great Victorian visual observer living at the dawn of the age of the new astronomy, astrophysics, 
But Bernard was also one of the first pioneers of wide field photography, and his discoveries and studies of these dark voids in space and his realization starting in 1913 from his observations, both visual and photographic, <clears throat> that they were really, in reality, foreground dark clouds of interstellar gas and dust, broke new ground in the science and changed our perception of the Milky Way galaxy and star formation. Edward Emerson Bernard straddled the divide between the old and new astronomy, and his work lives on the day both for the professional astrophysicist and the amateur astronomer alike. To E.E. E. Bernard, a clear night observing with a telescope was almost a sacred rite to search for the truth in celestial places. So I encourage everyone to get out tonight and try your hand at finding and observing the celestial truth of these elusive deep sky objects, the dark nebula of Edward Emerson Bernard. Now, if you'd like to read more about E.E. Uh, e. Bernard and his Dark Nebula, of course, a uh, good place to start is his photographic atlas. Again, the updated version by Jared Dobick from Cambridge Publication. Uh, if you'd like to read much, much more detail about Bernard's life, uh, there's a great book called The Immortal Fire Within, The Life and Work of Edward Emerson Bernard by William Sheehan. And of course, uh, periodically, uh, the various astronomical magazines come out with articles about E.E. E. Bernard and his dark nebula, and it's always a good idea to keep an eye out for those. And finally, of course, the internet is your friend. Just Google E.E. Uh, e. Bernard and dark nebula. And you'll get more information than you probably ever desired to know about dark nebula. Credits, of course, all the uh, professional images of dark nebula came from E.E. E. Bernard himself. Uh, the amateur video capture uh, EAA video astronomy images uh, were mine. Um, and of course, software used are Center Universe, Deep Sky Planner. Um, if you would like to uh, see more examples of some of my uh, attempts at Dark Nebula, you can go to my website, stellar-journeys.org, and scroll down the table of contents, and you'll see E.E. E. Bernard's Dark Nebula tour. Click on that link, and you'll get a new page where I have examples of Dark Nebula done mostly with video astronomy. And then finally, if you'd like to read this presentation again in much more detail than I've actually gone through the night, again on my website, if you scroll down the tab there to PDF downloads and go into that, you'll find uh, this presentation, E.E. E. Bernard and his Dark Nebula. And there's some other presentations there that might interest you on a cloudy night, uh, in particular if you have trouble getting asleep. So that does conclude my presentation on E.E. E. Bernard and his Dark Nebula. And at this time, I'd be happy to open up for any questions that you might have. All right, thank you, Larry. Uh, we do have a couple of questions. Uh, first one, is Bernard responsible for other catalogs or just the Dark Nebula catalog? Um, mainly just the Dark Nebula is what he's noted for. Uh, he did discover another uh, a number of other nebula. I, I don't remember what they are at the top of my head. Um, you know, but he did make some discoveries. And, of course, comets you know, was, was his forte also. And, of course, there, there are other dark nebula catalogs out there. Lynn, for example. Um, but, you know, Bernard's is a good way to sort of dip your toe into, you know, observing uh, dark nebula. Okay, uh, next. Uh, I, I know you mentioned uh, that the uh, in your credits there that uh, the black and white uh, dark nebula images uh, were uh, Bernard's. What about all the other black and white photos that were taken? Were those photos that he took or? Uh, everything that didn't have a label under it showing the telescope and the exposure, um, those were all Bernard's. Well, well, um, let me back it up. There were some historical comet pictures that were not Bernard's. Okay. I'm just, just looking for some examples of comets for that time period. I found those. But all the ones that had, um, um, let's see here, I can like back up, for example. Um, like that one right there, the horse head. That's that's mine. You know, I, I took that with an 8-inch Schmidt cast screen, a ZWO camera, uh, uh, an Optolong L Pro broadband filter for 60 seconds stacked for 15 minutes. 
Uh, what about some of those photos of the observatories? Are those his as well, or is that just some other photographer? Um, most of those are just um, like stock photographs. Um, uh, I don't think he, um, I mean, he did stage a couple, like those those two of him posing under the telescope. So those were staged and a, a, a photographer took those of him. Okay. Uh, next. Uh, at some point you mentioned a 36 inch refractor or did you mean a reflector? Um, no, it is a refractor. That was uh, the 36 inch refractor at Lick Observatory. Um, back in the day in the uh, um, 1887 and thereabouts, that was the largest refractor in the world at the time. Okay. Uh, the next question, uh, I've heard various things about mm -hmm. Yerkes Observatory. Seems one year it was open, the next year it was closed for demolition. What's the status of Yerkes today? Um, you know, I've heard that too. I'm not up on the most current news, but I guess, um, you know, some of these old observatories are hard to maintain and um, particularly Yerkes, which it wasn't built, you know, on a mountaintop and it's not in a, a very good location. The suburbs have grown around it. I know the University of Chicago, I think at one time was, uh, they may have actually sold it, but I think some type of association bought it. And I think they're going to try to restore it for public use. I don't believe it's going to be destroyed. That would be a crime. Uh, and I think I've got one more for you. Uh, is Bernard Starr still the one with the maximum proper motion? Yes, as far as I'm aware of. And it's fairly easy to find, too. All right. Any more? I think that'll do it. Uh, I'll go ahead and uh, switch it over to Doug. Uh, just hold steady. All right. Let me... Um... Doug, you have a go. Okay, Larry, thank you very much for that very interesting presentation. Thank you for being our speaker tonight. And it's a uh, pretty cool that we can actually have speakers from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania come and uh, share their presentations with our club. That's uh, that's one great thing that we've uh, been able to accomplish here with these online meetings. <clears throat> Next up, I have uh, members met a reminder about our JSEAS Star Party at the X-Bar Ranch. So uh, this is my last final reminder since it's this month that uh, we're all going out to the X-Bar Ranch. Uh, March 26th through March 30th, and then moving to Fort McCavitt, March 30th, 1st through April 2nd. Uh, X-Bar Ranch is like 58 miles west of Fort McCavitt, and uh, it's a place that we normally have the El Dorado Star Party in the fall, but this year we're going to try to have a JSEAS only uh, star party, and the Bortle Skies, or Bortle 2 Skies, same for Fort McCavitt. At X Bar, you can expect cabins and RV sites. I'm not sure what's left. I know that uh, last time I heard we had about eight or 10 of our members coming to it. If you reserve a cabin, you can use the lodge, which has a kitchen, dining room, which is pretty nice, and you can prepare meals there. All the cabins have bathrooms and showers in them. Got to bring your own food. Water is available. They're going to run electricity out for us on the observing field, so you don't have to worry about that too much. We'll, uh, they'll run that for us. You can make your reservations by going to the X-Bar Ranch website, which is shown here, www.xbarranch.com. And I think you actually have to call them for the RV sites. You can do the cabin uh, rental reservations on, on the webpage, but if you want to do a RV, you got to got to uh, call them. So I hope some more people will come and uh, join us. It's going to be great. I'm looking forward to it. First time we've ever done this. We'll see what happens. All right, next thing, I have a DIY astronomy homemade eyepieces. Yeah, I'm gonna shock you. Instead of doing astrophotography stuff, I'm gonna do on homemade eyepieces. So homemade eyepieces is made possible by our friends at Sur Surplus Shed who are now selling eyepiece sets, believe it or not. And I've listed some of the ones they have here. They have uh, Kellners, a variety of Kellner and reverse Kellners. They have some Plossels and Super Plossels and modified Plossels. They have Erfel, they have a RKE. I've listed the price for the different uh, IP sets. That's just the lenses in the sets. And they also sell a kit that has four different eyepieces in it, 
And uh, it also then has some extra lenses they send you just for fun. So I'm going to show you two different eyepiece designs that I've put together. I thought this was this is mostly just for fun. I mean that I've tried them and they actually work pretty good, but uh, it's the fun of making it yourself. That's why the DIY astronomy. So on this side, I'm showing you the on the left hand side, this is the Erfel eyepiece set. There you see the field lens on the left, and then the uh, here's the middle lens, and then here's the eye lens. And uh, here they are laid out here. The light comes in this side to the field lens, middle lens, here's the eyepiece lens. And over here, what I did for the, the eyepiece body is I started this one with a uh, two inch telescope T-thread metal adapter. And what I did is I 3D printed an insert to put inside here. So this insert is just, it's a, you know, it's 3D printed plastic. And then I printed these, these rings. And so what I did, I just used these rings to space the different lenses in here and keep them, you'd want to get them as close as possible to each other, but not touching. And these rings are tight enough that you can, they can do a press fit in here. So you press them in there and they're tight enough that they'll hold them in. I originally was gonna glue them in, but they're tight enough. I really didn't have to do that. And they stayed, so they're spacing between the lenses and then they're also the ones at the top and bottom to keep them from falling out. Um, the 3D printed components here, I did this in Fusion 360, which is free. I know that some people are kind of scared of Fusion 360, but the truth is I took a YouTube tutorial by a guy named Lars Christensen. It lasts 19 minutes and 55 seconds, and after I watched this, this guy gave me enough information to be able to do this. And I am not a mechanical engineer, I'm an electrical engineer, but I was able to figure this out and get this working by just watching this one tutorial. And then you can go to our local libraries, our, our Harris County Public Libraries have maker spaces, and they have 3D printers that you can use. You go there and you take a little class and you can take their user printers and you just charge a 10 cents per ounce, which goes a long way for making these things. Here's what Fusion 360 looks like. This is this is not the uh, Erfel one. It's gonna be the second eyepiece I show you, but this one uh, just shows you the, eye, the uh, body here. And it's basically just a, a bunch of cylinders all stacked up together and then hollowing them out to the different diameters you need for the different lenses. But uh, it looks a little scary at first, but after you fiddle around with it for a little bit, it's actually not too bad. Now, when you make your lens, uh, you're going to probably want to know, well, what really focal length is it? And uh, here's how you can measure the focal length. What you do is you can take your lens. There's my, there's my eyepiece. There's my thumb. And um, you take this lens, and you're in a bright room with the window across the room, and you project the pro project the image of the window here on the wall. There's a there's an image of the window on the wall. And once you have that, as long as you know the distance to from the eyepiece over to the window and the height of the window and the height of your actual image, like just by measuring how big this is, you can use this formula and you can calculate what the actual eyepiece of your, or sorry, actual focal length of your eyepiece is. Now, the other thing you need to do when you make an eyepiece is actually put in a field stop. So in this case, uh, what a field stop is, it's a little, uh, it's like a circle, a diaphragm that limits how much, uh, what angle the light comes through on the, on the eyepiece. And this is gonna limit off-axis aberrations. Here's a diagram that shows the telescope. Here's the objective lens, here's your eyepiece. And over here is the field stop. And where the objective lens comes to a focus and where the eyepiece comes to a focus, that's where you want to put your field stop. It's a, it's a diaphragm here, a circle to limit your aberrations. And you can see here where my, my field stop is. Now, if you're trying to figure out how to calculate the field stop, you can use a nice book like this one, Telescope Optics by Rutten. And uh, it has a, has a description there that tells you how to calculate the size of your field stop, or there's probably some online resources to do that as well. Okay, so here's the finished product of the Erfel. Uh, the two inch telescope adapter cost me 10 bucks. I got that off of a surplus shed. 3D printing cost me $2.70 at the library. The lenses were $12.50, and the field stop with a ring I just showed you and that cost four dollars fifty cents so the total is 29.70 not too bad for an Erfel eyepiece and in case you're not familiar with the Erfel eyepiece it's a 70 degree apparent field of view eyepiece it was actually the original wide field eyepiece design it was developed in 1917 and uh, this particular one turned out being a 31 millimeter focal length Erfel eyepiece and it works pretty good 
All right, the second one I'm gonna show you, this is a modified PLOSL. This one is, a, is approximately a 28 millimeter focal length. Here's the field lens, the middle lens, and the eyepiece lens for this one. In this case, uh, the light's coming from this end. There's a field lens, middle lens, eyepiece lens. Now on this one, I thought, well, why am I putting this inside a metal you know, container? Instead of why not just 3D print the whole thing? So that's what I did in this case. So what I did is I 3D printed this whole body and then I made some rings again to hold the lenses in there and then make spacers between the different lenses so they don't touch each other. And then in this case, I, I uh, also 3D printed the field stop. So there's the field stop for this particular one. Okay, so what's the cost on this one? 3D printing cost me $4.10. The eyepiece kit cost me $8.50. So for $12.60, I've got a modified PLOSL. Uh, and my understanding of this modified PLOSL design is it's 58 degrees apparent field of view, I think. I know what it is for the ERFL, but I'm not quite sure what it is for the modified PLOSL. But as far as I can tell, it's 58 degrees apparent field of view. And this one's a 28 millimeter focal length. And there's the... Uh, finished product. Okay, here it is mounted in a telescope. There's the modified PLOSL in a refractor telescope. And one more thing about this, uh, once you get your eyepiece, you think, well, there it is, where am I gonna put it in? Our friends at Agena Astro Products, they have these nice bolt cases you can buy. They're seven bucks each. And then you wanna put some caps on the end of your eyepiece. This one's real easy because it's a two inch cap. That's gonna fit you know, any two inch eyepiece. If you design your the top of your eyepiece correctly, you can find a cap, you know, from Geno Astro products that will go on there. The caps are pretty cheap. Though. I think I, I don't know if I said it or not, they're two or three dollars a piece. And of course, the bolt case is seven bucks. So there it is, homemade eyepiece. It's a little another fun project we can do as amateur astronomers. And uh, I had a lot of fun doing this, and I've looked at them, they, they look pretty good. So there you have it. All right. So next up, we have David with Star Party News. Hey, David. David, you have a go. All right, uh, that was that was very interesting, Doug, and that was an uh, an, ex an excellent uh, presentation, Larry. I thoroughly enjoyed that. Um, I was the one asked about the Yerkes status of it because uh, I've heard a few things from other, other speakers, so, okay. Star Party News for March, 2020. Uh, tomorrow, we have the South Shore uh, Magnolia Creek Golf Course uh, event. Um, moon's gonna be about 71% lit. We're gonna start around 5.30 to six, and we're just gonna play it by ear and go as long as it takes. Uh, two weeks ago, when Connie and I were out there, it, they, he already had like 40, 40 people signed up. So he's had two more weeks to advertise this. Um, as Doug mentioned, so, uh, March 26th, Sunday through March 30th, where the group's going to be going to the X-Bar Ranch. And then from Tuesday, 31st through April 3rd, people are going to be at Fort McAvitt. So by all means, please sign up and go for that. Uh, April 22nd or 23rd, discussions are still being uh, uh, had. Parker Williams Library contacted us and they wanted to do a um, meteor shower observation event at El Franco Lee Park. If you don't know immediately where that is, that's on the South Beltway, about halfway between 288 and uh, 45. It's a little on the north side for some of us. Uh, I personally may not be able to make that one even though it's fairly close to me. Um, but they were asking about you using scopes for meteor showers, and I tried to hold it, tell them the best thing for meteor showers is the uh, is the naked eye. Uh, but they'll be, they'll be there uh, given sunset. Uh, have a decent window from about eight fifteen through about ten o'clock when the park closes. And I have it on the uh, uh, calendar. Star party at the uh, Texas Star Party at the Prude Ranch is April twenty fourth through May first. We have five more dates under consideration with the Hack Winery. Um, the dates so far for October Fort McCavitt trip are confirmed. Um, October 28th will be the Houston All Clubs. We have no idea this far out who the speaker is going to be. And hopefully October 29th, we're going to actually have Astronomy Day at the George Observatory. That would, that would be a first. But because things are actually opening up, I want to be optimistic and hope there will be because things are beginning to relax. Both Doug and I are getting uh, requests for events, such as the uh, the Magnolia Golf Course one. 
Uh, other clubs are starting to get requests too. And uh, uh, things are starting to, re to relax as far as masks and stipulations, which hopefully is a good thing. All right. The event tomorrow, as I said, will be at the Magnolia Creek Golf Course. Um, uh, Connie and I will probably be there from about 5.30 or so onward. Uh, it's located at 1501 East Bay Area Boulevard at the corner of League City Parkway. Be very careful if you put in the wrong Bay Area Boulevard, as I did at one time. In the Google Maps, you could end up on the east side of I-45 of Bay Area Boulevard and in the wrong place. Easiest way to do that is to put in Magnolia, uh, Magnolia Creek Golf Course into Waze, and it should come up with a map that looks somewhat like this. It is definitely going to be going west off of uh, I-45. These pictures were nabbed when Connie and I did a little site visit. If I can get my mouse to work. The one up here uh, is actually from the parking lot. We'll be able to take our cars in around the back. And where those cars will come out is between these two buildings over here in front of the golf carts. Whether or not we can park back here is another issue, but we'll be able to unload because they will have this patio here cleared for us. There will be power supplied. Now further down, he also pointed out this area is a possible place to set up scopes. We possibly even could park there. Uh, in the upper right here, I've got more, more, uh, a little bit more view of the uh, of the deck that will be. And as you can tell down here in the lower right, this is only on the east. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah, on the east side, we've got this complete type of terrain all the way south and all the way to the right to the uh, to the west. And I was also reminded um, they do plan on feeding us. So, uh, so far, so far, I think it's going to be a, a a good thing. And if it works out, well, this could become a, a recurring event. He's absolutely tickled to uh, uh, have us out there. All right, March 4th, Hack Winery Recap. It was a small, intimate event with Trevor Quinn, Chris Randall, and myself and Connie. We had about 90 minutes of sky and about 40 minutes in, a, in, a, in, a tent, 40 in attention. Uh, 90 minutes of sky because we had clouds beforehand, and then after about 90 minutes, we had clouds that pretty much uh, banjacked us for the rest of the night. But as you can see, we got Trevor, this cute little rig that uh, uh, worked out real well. Connie's here. Here's a close-up of, uh, of Trevor's rig. And then over here was the to the left is the uh, daub that I brought. And Chris Randall sporting a new um, Wine and Stars um Star Party T-shirt that he had made. He, of course, brought in his his 28-inch beast in the back. So they said it was a nice, small, quiet event. We just wish it were a bit clearer with a bit more bit more people. Excuse me. Okay, this one came in from Paul Maley. Asked me to show this one. This is one of about 600 photos that they took on March 4th and 5th. They've just come back from this. He's going to have two more Northern Lights tours at the at uh, next March in 2023, and um, this is leading up to what's what he thinks is what what a lot of us seem to feel is the solar maximum, allegedly somewhere to occur between 2024 and 2025. By all means, see um, the his Eclipse Tour website um, for more details. But you see this right outside. You can see just to the uh, downside of the of the uh, aurora and trees. This is part of the lodge. Where we where where we stayed, Connie and I did this uh, roughly about three years ago, and I'm going to tell you we absolutely had an a, a, a fantastic time and a kind of kind of itching to go back. Now before you bulk, um, you're going to pay for it a little bit, but Paul covers a lot of stuff except for the travel to get there, except for the airline to get there. Once you're there, you're treated like treated like royalty with food and little excursions. Now, what I'm showing you here is, whoops, Arctic Circle. This was an excursion that was out of pocket that we uh, uh, that we paid for, and it was an absolute absolute uh, delight. It was an 18-hour trip. Um, you notice the latitude, 60, 66, 33. I have it down here off the GPS on my phone. Normally, that is 27.9. Um, so yeah, we were way up there. It was freaking cold, but it, it was a, a, a hysterical. It was a it was a great great trip. And uh, near the lodge, if you want to do sled riding, you can. These guys love it being outside. They don't like being inside where it's warm. They like being outside. 
Um, this is one of the, the snow scenes that we saw where the trees or the vertical trees are just kind of flocked with uh, flocked with snow. And yes, that is the sun coming through the uh, uh, winter fog. Uh, part of that tour also involves up close and personal with the Alaskan pipeline. Um, I can't recommend the overall trip enough. I said this little excursion to the Arctic Circle was quite a bit extra and is not included in the trip, but it is an option uh, when, when you're on this trip. So I do recommend this one. Um, Paul has a total eclipse tour that is all but so, uh, just about sold out for 2024. They are renting a small uh, cruise ship to sail out of Cabo San Loco, Cabo San Lucas, and chase the uh, uh, chase the totality on uh, April 8th of 2024. Okay, and that's going to wrap it up because this is kind of what we've been seeing all the time. Uh, with the clouds laughing at us saying, ha, 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 no astronomy for you. And then your sky charts telling you exactly where uh, Saturn and Jupiter are in the uh, cloud bank. And that's all, folks. Back to you, Doug. All right, Doug. Okay, David, thank you very much. And it's really kind of, it's a good thing to see so many things coming up and that we're having lots of activities planned. That, that, uh, that's a nice thing. So appreciate that. And appreciate you also being our Star Party Chairman. Okay, so that's it. Uh, next meeting is going to be April 8th. We're going to have Leonard Ferguson and Annie Wargetts are going to bring us open lines, reflections. So thank you very much for joining us tonight. And I hope you can join us again in April. See you then.